with me. Waiting for the ushers to get finished. That's all right, brother. All right. So listen, guys. I want you to watch the screen for a minute because I animated it. Yay. You all want to see that again? Watch. That was cool. So listen. Thank you. Thank you. I've been giving you all a little precursor, a little Bible prophecy before each message for the last few weeks. So how many of you know or heard about this UAP or UFO hearing they had with Congress in Washington, D.C.? Now, you may not know this, but it is the first time in the history of the United States that they've had a congressional hearing on this issue where men were sworn in under oath to testify. Now, it's been all over social media, all over the news, all over everything for the last couple of weeks. And I felt like it was time to share this with you. This is a part of the strong delusion that the Bible talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. And I'm going to show you that scripture here in a moment. And uh, matter of fact, I can tell you that this delusion is getting stronger. If anybody ever comes to you claiming to hear messages from aliens, Palladians, Intergalactic Federation, I'm telling you, this stuff's out there. It's the same demonic New Age stuff that's been around for thousands of years, and it is familiar spirits, it is demons. Everybody say demons. demons. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. These interdimensional, not intergalactic, by the way, they're interdimensional beings, did not fly light years, if it were possible, which it's not, to come here and preach not anti-Buddha stuff, but anti-Christ stuff. Everything they spew is against Christianity and against Christ. So without going into, oh, I could talk about this subject for hours, but without giving you the details, just so you know, demonic. Everybody say demonic. demonic. And did you know that in history, at whatever age or time period they're in, that's the technology that they supposedly show. Did you know that when uh, there was no airplanes, when they had only hot air balloons back in the day, most of us aren't old enough to remember that, but there used to be only hot air balloons. Did you know there were UFO sightings, not of flying saucers, but of balloons that were way technologically advanced? Why? Because they're always lying to the culture that they're in. And these are lies of the enemy. I'm telling you this so you know. So the Bible warns us about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. The coming of the lawless one, this is the Antichrist, okay, is according to the working of Satan. Everybody say of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders. Lying wonders, guys. Now, are they seeing real things in the sky? Yes. But like I said, they are not spaceships from another galaxy. Get Star Trek out of your mind. Get interdimensional, traveling from the dimension in the realm where the demonic spirits are to interfere with the things of man. The Lord calls them and calls Satan the prince of the power of the what? Of the air. Okay? Of the air. Lying wonders, verse 10, and with all unrighteous deception, everybody say deception, yes. among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Everybody say strong delusion. Strong delusion. That they should believe the lie, not a lie, but the lie. There is the lie that's coming. And the lie that's coming and I'm going to blow your minds, and some of y'all are going to think I'm crazy, but I love you anyway. Maybe I am, but maybe I'm not. I quoted to you earlier in this, as a matter of fact, let me go back to it. And you can write this down, Revelation 13, 4. It tells us that the whole world wonders after the Antichrist, after the beast, because of how he makes war. And 
I believe that these are going to mimic being his angels, the Antichrist angels, and they're going to participate with Antichrist in his warfare in the days ahead. And it's going to be that supernatural element that tries to convince the world that he's God when he is not. And I'll tell you what else. Christians are already being deceived into this mess. As if there's not enough delusion out there already. So don't you be. Fallen angels, demons, pretty simple. Amen? Be looking for Jesus. These guys are not coming to save planet Earth. That's their spiel. We're coming here. Y'all have messed up the Earth so much, and we've come. No, sin has messed up the Earth. And the only person can fix that is Jesus when he returns to establish his kingdom. Someone say amen. amen. Y'all still love me? Yes. All right, thank you. Let's pray. Let me go to the beginning here of my message. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for the good word of the Lord today. Father, I pray for the power and anointing of Holy Spirit to speak through me to these, your people. Let every word spoken be a word in season. Give them seeing eyes, hearing ears, and a heart to ponder your word and your truth. For those who know the truth, and the truth will set them free. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. The title of my message is The Heart of God to Seek and to Save. And you know, it's interesting, Miss Kayla didn't know my message, and she already preached probably half of it out of Ezekiel. And that last song, I love that last song too, because it said this, it said, I need to know God's heart so that his heart can be in me. Amen. And that's what these series of messages have been all about, is we need to understand the heart of God so that we can get his heart into us so that we can begin to see people through the eyes and through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're going to need it more and more in these last days. And these are the last days. Someone say amen. amen. To seek and to save. So let's get started. So we believers must be most concerned with those things Heavenly Father is most concerned about. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get distracted. Look at your neighbor. Say, don't get distracted. <laughs> How many of you know that there's a lot of things that you can get distracted with? Amen? How many of you know? A lot of important things, right? But how many of you know that the Scripture tells us there are certain things that are the most important to the heart of God? Those are the things I need to be concentrating on. Amen? Otherwise, I may have run my race in futility because I am so distracted doing what I want to do for God instead of doing those things that God says are most important that he wants the church interested and involved in. Someone say amen. So how do I know those things? Well, that's what we're going to continue to learn. We need to know God's heart. To know what he wants us to do in our life, we have to know the heart of God. Amen? Have you ever worked adults for a boss where you knew them so well, you already knew what they wanted before they asked you? Right? Because you knew their heart. Or somebody asked you a question for them to respond to, and they responded, but in your mind, you already knew the answer they were going to give because you already knew their heart. You see, when you know the heart of God, you can give a good response and a good answer to people. Why? Because it won't be from your own mind. It'll be from his heart and from his perspective. Amen? If the Lord has a heart of compassion for lost humanity, what do you think our heart should be? Everybody say the same. Now, is it always? No. Because how many of you know it's easy to get caught up in the flesh and it's just like, you know, I, I shared with y'all before or with my Sunday school class, it was William Shakespeare who said in speaking about the attorneys, he said, you know, just kill them all and let God sort them out. <laughs> that was William Shakespeare, Mr. Eloquent, right? I didn't say that. He said that. But how many of you know that there's a lot of Christians that walk around with that same mentality? And I'm here to tell you that we are not the sons of thunder. Amen? 
we're not here to call fire down from heaven. We're here to show the heart of God, to give lost humanity one last opportunity to repent before Christ returns. How many of you have ever heard of D.L. Moody? D.L. Moody was a great evangelist who lived from, I think, 19, I'm sorry, 1837 to 1899. Got saved in 1855. He uh, preached revivals throughout the Civil War era. He served on the side of the Union. Um, he was called into full-time evangelism in the 1870s, and he became one of the leaders of the Second Great Awakening throughout the United States, preaching the gospel. Have you ever ha heard of Moody Press? He started that. He also started several Bible schools and missionary schools. Great man of faith, great man of God. He said this, he said, this lost world will never be reached and brought back to loyalty to God until the children of God wake up to the fact that they have a mission in the world. If we are true Christians, we should all be missionaries. Amen? Missionaries. What's a missionary? It's a man or a woman on a mission, right? Somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, I want to be a missionary in Japan, in Croatia, in Swahili land, right? That's awesome. The question is, are you a missionary where you're at today? Because if you can't be a missionary in the culture you're in, with the culture you know, with the language you know, how in the world do you think you're going to be able to easier share your faith somewhere else? You're not going to be able to. So being a light to the city starts right here, right now, in your life, with your children, with your family. Someone say amen. All right, so let's get into this parable here this morning. Here we are in Luke chapter 15, verse 8 through 10. Or what woman, Jesus says, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Now, put that in modern verbiage. If you lose something in your house and it's nighttime out, you're going to probably put flashlight mode on your phone. You ever lose something in your car at night? or lose something in your house, and maybe people are sleeping, and you put it on flashlight mode, you're searching all around for it, right? And this woman's searching carefully until she finds that she lost a silver coin. When she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. She was pretty excited. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now listen to me. I want to give you a quick little analogy here. If there's, say, an entrepreneur, and he develops some new type of engineering marvel that is worth, say, $150 million dollars, and to be safe, he doesn't want to put it on the computer or on anything else. So he puts it on one of those thumb drives. You ever see one of those thumb drives? Then it's the only copy he has. He's worked his whole adult life on it. He loses the thumb drive. Whew. How many of you think he'd be searching everywhere for it? He'd be telling all of his friends, guys, remember that invention I had? I lost the design. Sounds like something I'd do, but I wouldn't put it all on the thumb drive. I lost the design, Pamela. I lost it. I'd be freaking out if that were me, right? And if you're a friend of his and you care about him, you'd be, oh, my goodness, did you look here or did you look here? Y'all ever lose your keys, right? It's so funny. My wife, she's so good at finding things. I could call her up at work, tell her I can't find my keys, and she'll tell me where they're at. <laughs> From the other side of the city. Am I lying, Mama? No, it's true. She's just, she knows me. She's pretty good at that. So, have it, I know I'm the only one, but have y'all ever lost something, right? I mean, you're desperately looking, desperately looking. Listen, this is the whole key here, guys. 
why do you think, verse 10, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents, who turns from their ways? Why is there that joy? And why is Jesus giving us the parable of this woman who lost something of such great value that when she finds it, she just has to tell everybody? You see, I think in heaven there's a proclamation every time a sinner repents, every time somebody comes to faith in Christ, some way, somehow, the angels of God know it. I'm not going to pretend to tell you how I know they know it, other than the Scripture says they know. Somebody's telling them. Amen? They're not omnipotent. Am I right? So some way, somehow, they know somebody's come to faith. And the angels of God, it says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. Joy. Everybody say joy. joy. Hallelujah. Joy. Amen? So there's joy. Why? Because something of great value to God the Father has been found. What's of the greatest value of all? The soul of the human being. Everybody look at your neighbor say, your soul is important to God. I asked my Sunday school class this morning, what, if somebody came up to you and said, what's the most valuable thing you own? Most people are going to say, oh, my house, my car. Maybe somebody will say, my time. The truth is the most valuable thing you own is your soul. Is your soul. What will a person trade their soul for? For what shall a man give his soul for? Right? What does it profit a man to gain the entire world, all the wealth of the world, but to lose his own soul? What value is the human soul, y'all? What value does God place upon the human soul? It's invaluable. Everybody say invaluable. There is no lack of value to it. Amen? No lack of value. It is the most valuable possession. How valuable is it? It's so priceless that God gave his only begotten son, John 3.16, so that whosoever believes in him would not perish but would have what? Eternal life. So God so loved the world. Why did he so love the world? He loves the human soul. It's of such value that he made the ultimate sacrifice to send Jesus to die on our behalf. Now, people don't realize sometimes what a great sacrifice that was. Jesus is the word of God, amen? He had been with God the Father for eternity, never separated. And the sin of the world was placed upon Jesus. And for that moment of time, there was that separation not to mention the physical agony and torture, right? It's a big deal, guys, really big deal. Six hours of torture. If I say six hours, from 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon, six hours of torture, and that's just on the cross. Not to mention the beating and having his beard plucked from him, the crown of thorns stuck in his head, being whipped 39 times on the back with a Roman whip, little pieces of steel and glass that would pull away the flesh. In Isaiah, it says that he was more marred than any other man. It's a prophecy of Messiah, that he'd be more beaten than any other human being and still be alive. Shev died before he even got to the cross. I'm not trying to be overly graphic, but I want you and I to understand that's the value that God has placed on the human soul. On your soul, on my soul, and the soul of all these people who are evil and doing evil who don't know better. The blasphemers and the unbelieving. Infinite worth is what the soul is worth. Each human soul is unique. Everybody say unique. unique. Created in the image of God. How many of you have ever heard that uh, snowflakes are unique, right? Every snowflake is different. Every human soul is different. And there's, what, almost 7 billion people, I think, is the latest count on planet Earth, approaching 7 billion. And with those 7 billion souls, no two souls are alike. 
even identical twins, genetically identical in every way, have different souls that God has placed within them. Did you know that science, and you can fact check me as well on this, but did you know that science has made it where they have seen under a microscope the moment of conception with the sperm and the egg, and in that moment of conception, did you know there's a flash of light? There is a flash of light. And I believe that's the soul entering into that human entity. A flash of light. Look it up. It's amazing. I've seen it. It's mind-blowing. God is light, amen? And he's placing that human soul and at that moment of conception, there's a flash of light. And it's cool to see. So the souls of infinite worth. This gives every soul value and worth beyond comprehension. Beyond you and I can't imagine how valuable the soul is. I think if we did, we would be so much more in love with people and with trying to bring Jesus Christ to the lost masses or the lost ones or twos than we are. Sacrificial love. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God's only Son on the cross, guys, for the salvation of humanity. This is the extraordinary value that God places on the human soul. It underscores that value because God sent Jesus. That's how valuable. Somebody asked once, how do I know that, that God loves me? Because he sent Jesus Christ to die for you. The Son of God. How many of you have children? Would you send your children to die for a wicked person? I don't know of anybody who would. Yet God sent Jesus to die for a wicked world. We didn't deserve it. Now I know this is basic, but this is the heart of God. We need to get his heart in us so we can reflect his heart. Amen? This act of sacrificial love, guys, it's the ultimate demonstration of the soul's value. John 15, 12 through 13 the Lord says, this is my commandment, that you what? Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, I know we often quote this at funerals of soldiers and those who have died fighting for our freedom, which is a worthy thing. But in all honesty, guys, this is really speaking to Jesus who laid down his life for you and for me and for all of humanity. Woe is us if we neglect so great a salvation as we have in Jesus. How much simpler is it than whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? How much simpler could the Lord possibly have made it than to believe in his name? He did all the work. He did it all. Everybody say he did it all. We just have to walk in it, trust it, and believe it. Amen? Redemptive plan. Did you know that God has a redemptive plan for humanity from Genesis through Revelation? It starts off in the Garden of Eden with the fall of man, and it ends with the restoration of man to God in Revelation chapter 22. And throughout all the pages of the Scripture, you see the entire plan of redemption unfold before your eyes. God didn't start the plan of redemption when Jesus came to this earth. That was a fulfillment of the plan he's been working on. Matter of fact, it tells us that this plan was in place before the foundation of the world. So I want to share something with you the Holy Spirit just brought to my mind off my notes back in the early 1900s in Europe in Germany there was a little boy fell into a river and a priest was walking by it's a true story a priest was walking by saved that little boy's life. You know who that little boy turned out to be? Adolf Hitler. 
true story. Now think about this. And you don't have to answer. I'm not looking for an answer. And I've thought about this. If I knew the evil that Adolf Hitler would end up doing, would I have, had I been walking down the river, saved him from the river's edge? Say, well, what's that have to do anything with anything, Pastor? This is what I was thinking about yesterday and last night. God is outside of time and space, right? Do you know that he already knows those people who will choose free will? Everybody say free will. He already knows those people who will choose his plan of redemption and commit their lives to Christ. He doesn't make them. Listen to me. But he knows because he's God. He already knows. You can see yourself worshiping in Revelations. You're in the future. Did you know that? I know it's mind-blowing, but I'm telling you, God's outside of time and space. And he already knows those who will not make it. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that he already wrote the names of you and I in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Before you were even alive, before you were even a clue in mom and dad's eyes or a twinkle in their eye, God already had your name down in his book. Now I'm getting deep. But listen to me. God, because of his great patience and love, still endures all those who do wickedly that he knows will never repent until his patience runs out. And it's approaching that time. That's when Jesus will come back to this planet, make war against the nations. They make war against him. They will be destroyed, and he will establish his kingdom for a thousand years. That's coming. So God's great love, how, how, how valuable is the soul that God, even though he knows that these people will never, ever repent because he's God, he still allows them to live life. It's amazing when you think about it. Amazing. The soul of man is of such value and God places that value on every soul more than you and I could ever imagine. So the next time you look at a human being who does evil with contempt, you think about this. You remember God loves the soul of that person. He hates evil. I've been praying for China this week. You hadn't heard. I told you before, guys, that the mainstream news only shows you what they want to show you. You don't really get world news on mainstream news. China's been going through some of the worst flooding in their history of their country. Entire cities being hundreds and hundreds of cars with people in them being swept away. These are real people with families and loved ones. Do I hate communism with all my heart? But I love the people. God loves the people. Amen? Have a heart. Things should move you. When you watch the news or you hear about something in the city or in your neighborhood or in our congregation where somebody's hurting or going through a difficulty, it should move us with compassion. Amen? We should care. We should care because God cares. And for you to have the heart of God, you have to care like he cares. You have to love like he loves. Amen? The eternal perspective, the understanding of eternal life, guys, in our faith, further underlines the value of the soul. Do you know all throughout the Christian faith, we speak of eternal life that God has gifted to the believer who believes in Jesus Christ? Someone say amen. And this eternal life is life forever. That used to be a big deal with the early church, amen? Man, they, they used to get stoked about eternal life. So much so, they were standing in line to get martyred because they wanted a better resurrection in the life to come. I said, man, these guys, that's faith. That's faith, amen? Eternal life is where your soul 
and your body, by the way, and your spirit, new body, everybody say new body, resurrected body, gets a Holy Spirit body shop job, amen? Everybody said amen Amen to that, right? A new body, this body can inherit heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But a resurrected body, you can read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 15, but eternal life that was given to you and I, guys. Humans are mortal, but our soul is eternal. It's eternal destination matters deeply to God. There's only two destinations. The final destination for the believer is the presence of God. Notice I ain't say heaven because we're going to be on this earth for a thousand years. Then there's going to be a new heavens, a new earth, and a golden city, a new Jerusalem, and all the things in the Bible that Christians everywhere know nothing about. Sorry. Sad. Heartbreaking. These are the promises of God to God's people. They matter to God. Your soul matters to God. And, of course, there's the other eternal destination, amen, which is the lake of fire, or even hell is cast into the lake of fire. We don't even know what that's going to be like. It doesn't give us a lot of details. It just calls it second death. It's not going to be good. It wasn't created for human beings. It was created, the Bible says, for Satan and for his fallen angels. 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that what? Any should perish, but all should come to repentance. It is God's will for all men everywhere to come to repentance. Never wonder, is it God's will for them to be saved? Yes, it is. Everybody say, yes, it is. You see, the the Calvinists back in the days of old, they had this thing. They thought, well, because God knows everything, he's already decided who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. See, I don't believe the scripture teaches that at all. He teaches who knows because he's God, but he gives every human being the choice. He gives everybody the choice. And it's God's desire that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Amen? That's the heart of God. Everybody say, that's the heart of God. The most wicked, evil people that you can think of on this planet, one just popped to my mind, George Soros. God would love to see him come to repentance. Amen? I pray for him. Pray for his family. Come to faith in Christ. Oh, Lord. Can I go five more minutes, guys? Y'all don't mind? This side doesn't mind. This side didn't say anything. Do y'all mind? Luke 15, through through 5. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he had found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. A wayward sheep is a sheep that wanders from the flock into danger. And how many of you know that shepherds have some sheep, and these sheep wander away from the flock all the time. It's not like a sheep wanders just once. Some sheep just have that wandering spirit. I've met them. Been doing this 42 years. I've met them. They wander, they come back, they wander, they come back, they wander, they come back. Sometimes they don't come back. Just wander. And so what the shepherd does is he takes the sheep can't lift Pastor Jeremy on my shoulder, so I'd use him as an example. (laughs) Takes the sheep, puts the sheep on his shoulders, and carries it. One of the roles of the shepherd is to set boundaries for his sheep. His boundaries are there for the protection and care of the sheep. God sets boundaries in our life because he loves your soul. Everybody say, God loves my soul. He sets boundaries in our life because he loves you. They're there to protect you and to care for you. Amen? He may break the sheep's legs so it cannot wander away. 
This forces the sheep to be dependent on the shepherd for care. If your legs are broken, how many of you know you have no choice but to rely on somebody else, right? When you get a knee replacement or a hip replacement, you've got to rely on those other people who are near you and around you, right? Because you can't get up and do anything. God bless y'all. It's a hard thing. But sometimes in life, we're wandering the wrong direction, and the Lord loves your soul enough to try to get you back. So he may allow a tribulation or two into your life try to bring you back on the right course. Can you think of a time where God may have been treating you like a wayward sheep that he loved? I can. And I'm thankful for it, amen? Thankful for his love. Here's a sheep right here with a shepherd. And that's how they'd carry them. So that sheep just has a bad habit of wandering off. Every time he's looking around, the shepherd would say, okay, where's that sheep? And that sheep would be off wandering away by himself. Now, why is that dangerous? Because when you wander from the flock by yourself, you become open game to the coyotes, to the wolves, to everything else. They're not going to attack the flock. They're looking for that straggler. Everybody say that straggler. Yes. Don't be that straggler. Someone say amen. Yes. This is the heart of God. The heart of God is to carry you and I on his shoulders to keep you and I from wandering off. Because all of us have wandered at times, myself included. Amen? As we come in for a landing, Luke 15, 6 through 7, when he comes home, the shepherd, he calls together his friends again, the neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Amen? Have you ever lost a dog before? Terrible feeling, terrible feeling. My wife and I went on a vacation one time. We had somebody house set for us, and we came back, and the dog was gone. Had run away. Did we ever find that dog? We never found that. Sorry, my memory, I can't remember. Never found the dog. It was sad. It was a good dog. Gypsy, wasn't it Gypsy? Huh? Missy. Well, I remembered the dog at the time. <laughs> if I ever have a question about details, I'll just ask my wife. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now, this is actually a joke Jesus tells here. Why is this a joke? Because everybody needs repentance. There are none righteous, right? So what he's really talking about is the religious leaders and people of the day who think that they're okay, but you've got that one who repents and turns to God. That's where the joy in heaven is. Now you get it? Jesus actually has a sense of humor. Let's all stand to our feet.